but I'd like to ask a question if that's possible. Sure. It's at the end of the presentation. Hey, Rolf. Um, we are we are at, at our time limit here. Do you think you could move that question to the chat for Chris? Yeah, um, no problem. Yeah. And if you wouldn't mind just chatting in, in the FN virtual tool, that way all the attendees can see that as well. And Michael, let's go ahead and uh, have you start your presentation so we can stay on schedule. Sure. I should be able to end up a minute or two early, get it on time. So, uh, so okay, um, this is a presentation on leak detection and intervention. This is an actual uh, white paper that we're working on. So this will be a new content uh, either towards the end of the year or probably approved early next year. So I'm, I'm leading a, a working group um, as part of the uh, ACS Coplate subproject, and we've got a team uh, working on this. Um, so why is leak to why is leak really important? Obviously, if you haven't gotten this far in the meeting, um, you know that's important for uh, cooling high power components efficiency and overall uh, highest compute density in systems. <clears throat> Now, liquid cooling may already exist in some data centers, but bringing into IT, bringing into the actual racks and actual servers is where there's some cause for concern. Um, usually, in very first conversations on liquid cooling, one of the first things that come up is concerns over uh, leakage, you know, what to do around IT equipment. You know, everybody's afraid of fluids around their you know, expensive motherboards and processors. So it's definitely a, a big area for concern. So definitely important for our, like data center customers. Like I said, we're working on a, currently working on a white paper, uh, and in the white paper we're addressing detection, mitigation, and intervention. We're giving pros and cons for each one. Uh, it's pretty high level. It's not a specification. It, it's a white paper kind of highlighting the concerns, um, also highlighting things like risk and and you know at a very high level uh, how to work around those risks. Okay. So still as part of an introduction, we're looking at the white paper in terms of documenting um, detection and intervention techniques and help grow the industry awareness. Uh, again, we're trying to get information out there without stifling creativity. Um, and we're really focused on the, the data center, inside the data center. So like the technology cooling system, TCS loop, as Asher would call it, or like secondary loop, as some people call it. And that's really where we're looking. We're not so much looking at, for this paper at least, we're not looking at the leak detection at the facility level. So we're looking at, say, end of row CDUs, uh, cooling racks, or even uh, in rack CDUs, and uh, the different pathways you'd have a fluid all the way to the component. So that's kind of the level that we're looking at for leak detection and intervention. Okay, just a real quick outline. Uh, I probably won't go into this much detail because it's in the next slides, but this is what we're looking at the for the white paper. We're giving um, quick introductions and design considerations, and we go into a few specific examples, which are still working on this part of the document. Um, uh, next, we'll go into leak detection and mitigation, as well as leak intervention, um, as well as conclusions and glossary and references. Again, I'll go into each one of these in the next few slides. All right, so as part of the overview, like I said, we're going to be looking at the TCS, the secondary uh, liquid loop. Um, specifically, we're looking at cold plates, integrated pumps, manifolds, cooling distribution units, heat exchangers, heat pipes, uh, or sorry, pipe works, hoses, couplings, uh, the cooling fluid itself. So those are the main things that we're, we're looking at in the um, secondary loop, and around the connections where we think there may be a uh, leak or risk for, for a leak and how we might um, do detection uh, in those areas. Real quick, some common definitions in terms. This is just a few definitions that we have in the document. We've got a whole section of definitions. Um, when we talk about detection, it means actually detecting or finding the leak event. 
uh, mitigation is preventing the likelihood of a leak event. Uh, intervention is, is actually acting on it. So once a leak has been detected, um, what would the act you would take to uh, intervene? Uh, so acting on the event. Um, information technology equipment, ITE, uh, basically computational servers, networks, uh, communication devices, data storage. So the, the components uh, in the system that we're worried about not getting wet. Um, and then just another example would be like manifold uh, distributes fluid from danger to multiple IT loads. So um, just some examples of the definitions we have in term um, to be included in the documentation. All right. So in the example section so far, we have um, some information on like some examples of like some O-rings, some wet material. Um, lists and, and overing compatibility. And we also have some examples on quick disconnects and some fatigue, possible fatigue issues. Um, we're trying to capture as many failure mechanisms from the industry uh, as possible. Uh, we're, we're looking to national labs and, and basically anyone willing to share stories. And um, yeah, if it can be shared with anonymity. We don't have to say, oh, so-and-so had this issue. Um, and we are still looking for a few more examples. So if anybody, is interested in helping the industry out, sharing some examples, sharing some horror stories, um, basically what not to do. Um, and they're willing to share, please contact me. Uh, my information is below. Um, again, we, you know, section of the white papers, we're showcasing, showcasing some of these examples just to highlight design elements. You know, do this, not that sort of thing. Okay. So leak detection and mitigation. So there are two forms of detection, uh, and that would be indirect and direct detection. So examples of indirect detection uh, would be monitoring the pressure in a system. So uh, not necessarily at the node, at the compute you know, chassis level, uh, but maybe for a rack, we would look at the pressure drop for the fluid uh, being supplied to a whole rack. Um, also, if there's a reservoir either in the CDU or in the manifold, we would um, track the coolant level in the reservoir, see if that goes down. That'd be a definite sign of a leak. Um, and the last two are kind of related. So we've got optical sensors or, or even turbidity sensors. So this is basically looking for bubbles in the flow. If you have bubbles in your flow, it's a sign that you have air or, or gas leaking into your system. All right, so those are kind of the indirect detections. Now, direct detections would be actually trying to sense a pool or some sort of a drip of the, the fluid, the coolant fluid. So things like cable sensors, uh, as you can see in the picture here, uh, can be placed around the bottom of a rack or the bottom of a CDU, uh, especially routing them where there are interfaces where there's you know points of failure. Um, so if there is a leak, it'll drip down and touch the cable and you'll get a signal. Um, the other thing you have similar to a cable would just be a, a spot leak detector. Um, a lot of times spot detectors are like handy in uh, somewhere where you have like containment, like if you have a pan at the lowest point in the pan, you could have a point leak detector. Um, it's typically where you'd see a point as opposed to the cable. The cable's one of the more common uh, ways of you know, detecting leaks. All right, so once you've detected your leak, there's different ways to intervene. Um, these can be, so be manual or automated. Um, typically, typically we've, we've heard and observed that automated um, leak detection really should be in a very, um, used very sparingly, I should say. Uh, most customers don't want their systems just shutting down. Um, they're concerned, they're, they're cautious, but they, they want a very extreme example before they would shut down a system. Um, so in that case, a lot of times manual would be a, a better way for intervening because um, then you've, you've got basically another level of judgment as far as, yeah, we're actually going to you know, do a manual shutoff valve and shut off flow to a system. Uh, but in general, um, reactions can be automated, the intervention can be automated. Um, but we just find a lot of people don't want their system shutting down without um, having more 
you know knowledge of exactly why it's shutting down. So it's it's definitely a last resort as far as automation. Um, manual and you can have your sensors that would maybe trigger a light, trigger some sort of signal to go to a technician in a lab, and then they can go and determine if an actual um, intervention needs to happen. <laughs> All right, and then I'll open up with the last nine minutes for questions. So definitely for more information, go to the ACS Go Plates, got some links here, got some contact information. Um, we are frequently in our Go Plate meeting is uh, second Wednesday of each month and usually giving an update on the leak detection and intervention as well as other uh, programs we discussed today. Um, the actual paper, um, we've been holding almost weekly meetings, trying to make good progress on that. Um, so let me know if you'd like to be involved in that. So without further plugging, uh, are there any questions uh, about leak detection intervention? Any questions about the white paper? Michael, we do have one question um, from Dale Sarkler. He's asking, uh, shouldn't the CDU have a leak tray as well? Oh, sorry. Uh, definitely. Um, containment is an important thing. Um, not every design will have containment for everything. Um, and definitely how big of containment do you do is, is kind of subject to judgment. So, um, <laughs> so it's a it's a definite maybe, <laughs> and again, it's not. This isn't going to be intended to be a specification, uh, as in you you must do this. But we'll definitely list it as one of the things to have as containment for CDUs, um, under racks, uh, different areas where there's uh, you know high risk of flow, and then just the question is is how much containment do you include? Um, yeah. Is it, you know, for the flow rates of a given system, you know, is it a few minutes of, of leakage? Um, if you think of a system was left to, you know, run for a long time, um, the flow could be even more than what the reservoir in the CDU is. So, um, yeah, those are my thoughts on that. So, but definitely containment in the CDU area is very good. Other questions? I don't see any other questions right now. Um, folks, if you do have any questions, oh, looks like we've got one okay. via the Zoom chat, actually. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read that. Uh, the question is, indirect cooling mm -hmm. via cold plate has been around forever, mm -hmm. TCM. Leaks are always an issue that's been raised by many. An issue that needs to be explained by groups like yours to speed up cold plate broader implementation. And that's um that's there in the Zoom chat, Michael. If you want to read mm -hmm. that, it's from Agonifer. Agonifer, it looks like you're on the Zoom call. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, ha have a conversation. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 I'm actually worked at IBM for several years and very mm -hmm. familiar with the thermal conduction module. But there's uh, water always gets a bad rap, even though we have got quick disconnects, all kinds of solutions to problems, but still yeah. is an issue. So I, I appreciate this group uh, stuff that mm. you're doing. We're also working on liquid cooling as well. So uh, I, I hope that you can reach more people so it can be broader mm. impl implementation. Can you say something about when you expect to see broader implementation? I was happy about the Google, for example, TPU3s, mm. uh, uh, right? Uh, retrofitting uh, racks to um, to uh, implement uh, liquid cooling, but I I'd like to see broader implementation. W what do you think? Mm. Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, working for Intel, we definitely see a broader implementation of liquid cooling. Um, uh, I am seeing a lot of increase in interest throughout the industry. So when I talk to people, there's a lot more questions on liquid cooling. Um, and I think that's part of why you're seeing a lot more material in forms like these where the people are going in and looking at immersion cooling, co-plate cooling, et cetera. 
Um, and our leakage presentation is not limited to any one particular fluid. I, I'd given a um, what a materials list earlier on polypropylene glycol, but we're also looking at water and refrigerants, et cetera, as far as leak detection. Um, so there's definitely demand, just, just overall compute demand. <laughs> there's demand for you know, better cooling technology, including different forms of liquid. Um, and there is no you know, front runner, everybody's doing this. It's, it's you know, unlike air right now, uh, air cooling is pretty popular, um, but there are a lot of people looking in a lot of different directions at a lot of different fluids. Just a, a quick follow-up. Uh, okay. uh, packaging, especially heterogeneous integration. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, we don't seem to talk about it in this community, but certainly that's going to drive the cooling technology, right? Packaging, is, I, I consider cooling as a subset of packaging. Mm -hmm. And that if you're going to start stacking 2 and half d and 3D, you know, unequal yeah. profiles or even, you know, stack on top of each other, how are you going to cool it? So, and you're going to get performance through that heterogeneous integration. So mm. are the community ready and say, look, you know, we better address it. I don't see enough discussion. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So stacking technologies, um, as well as you're seeing higher and higher component powers uh, for a variety of components. Um, so there, there's definitely a demand for better uh, cooling technology out there. Um, yeah, I definitely see it both from a package technology demand, um, things like stacking, uh, as well as uh, uh, just from overall power levels increasing and um, a lot of like uh, XPU type compute applications where you have higher and higher power uh, systems to be cooled. Thank you, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, Michael, we got another question coming in um, from Alex Lin. Alex okay. is asking about whether or not the optical sensor is in fact the preferred one. Um, looks like Alex is also on the Zoom call. Alex, if you want to discuss hmm. verbally. Yeah, I'm interested in, in the bullet point number three of the indirect detection, which you mentioned about using an optical sensor to monitor hmm. the liquid coolant. Do you have a, an example about how that works? Because most of the sensor is like to detect the, uh, because the physical uh, liquid was declared and then, then block the register and, and, and then send out a signal. I'm not hmm. quite sure about how optical sensor can help with this uh, interest situation. Just curious about that. Right. Um, three and four are kind of related. So again, the, the theory with optical is, if you have no leaks in the system and you have no air entering the system, your fluid will be constant. Um, you know, in the example of a polypropylene glycol, you need to have like your green fluid flowing through. Other fluids will be different colors, blue, red, et cetera. But you'll have pretty much the same color fluid going through. When you have a leak in the system and it's adding air bubbles into the system, you will, um, <clears throat> you'll start to see the, the overall color of the fluid get lighter because you got these air bubbles um, adding some turbidity to the fluid and, and it'll, it'll show up a difference. So you'll have to have um, you know, a clear part of tubing, a clear window to look into your fluid as it flows, flows by. Um, and again, optically you would uh, detect um, basically a large increase in air bubbles in the system. So that's how that would, that would work. And you definitely want that like downstream of components that are higher risk to, to have leaks. Understand. So basically, it will you it, it will be able to identify uh, if uh, if a coolant uh, spit on certain region because the yeah, the the color of coolant, right? It, it's more of if you have air spilling into your coolant loop. So that's okay. what you're observing. Yeah. Oh, okay. The bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's why it's indirect because you're you're detecting the the air the air bubbles. Uh, yeah. Okay. Michael, I saw a couple other folks uh, mm -hmm. on the Zoom. Um, do any of you folks who, who recently joined the Zoom call have any questions for Michael? Looks like they may have just been joining to join. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the next presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So our next scheduled session is um, not until noon Pacific time. Um, 
Michael, I'm not sure how we want to use the next uh, eight to nine minutes. I don't, I don't want to make anyone miss content if they're planning on joining at noon um, for, for Jeff's mm. talk. Oh, let's see. I definitely made up more time than I needed to. So um, let me see if there's anything else to be worth adding to that I skipped over. Want to make anyone miss content if they're planning on joining? Hey, Michael, I have a question to you. Can mm -hmm. you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Shlomo. Hey, how you doing? So I, I, you probably had the question before. Um, I, I just wanted, more time than I needed to. So, just wanted uh, to bring it up again. Why not eliminate leads? Adding to. Let's get over. So why not eliminate leaks? Let me let me guess where you're going with this. Are, are you going with uh, um, negative pressure flow? That's the obvious one. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, there's. I think you're recording something in the background too. Um, but yeah, definitely um, other technologies we're going to talk to in the the white paper. Um, we'll we'll maybe have a line or two on negative pressure flow being a way to avoid leaks. You know, we talk about mitigation um, and avoiding leaks in general. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to have a lot on it in the paper. Um, this other probably won't be a chapter on it, but there will definitely, um, I would expect at least one line in there. And, you know, one way to approach it is, uh, you know, negative pressure um, to avoid leaks in the system. Michael, we do have another question here from, uh, from Jason mm -hmm. Rathheim. Uh, he's asking, how sure. do you mitigate leaks in the lines for cabinets? In lines for cabinets? Yes. How to mitigate leaks in the lines. It's a good question. Um, mitigate leaks in the lines. Usually it's the, the big concern is around the interfaces. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to answer this one. Um, can you maybe elaborate on the question a little bit more? Uh, you type a little bit more specifically in it where you're where you're looking. Uh, we can do better than that. Jason has now joined the Zoom. Nice. So, um, Hi, Jason. As soon as his audio sets up, we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Jason, looks like you're muted here, so I'll ask you to unmute. And make sure and unmute and yes to unmute. So. <laughs> it's always two button of these tools. Hey, Jason, can you hear us? Hey, Jason, we're seeing you as unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Drop Jason a quick chat here. Okay. You can just talk, right, Jason? Don't have to be. All right. Um, Jason is asking. Uh, how in the piping and couplings from the CDU to the reservoirs? With those leaks. Pipe are around the horse. And again, I'm, I'm pausing because I keep on thinking of the ways to uh, detect and not so much ways to mitigate. Um, uh, probably it comes down a lot to the overall design. Um, and especially in you know, a previous presentation, we were looking at the flexure in your whole manifold system. So defining for, you know, designing the system such they can handle uh, those kind of flexures under pressure, um, under load, just under the mass of the system. Um, other things as far as mitigation you want to consider are coefficients of heat expansion. So um, as your whole system warms up and cools off, um, you're going to have expansion contraction in your, your, your couplings. Um, 
so designing for all of that uh, to minimize the, the leakage that, that could occur. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, Michael. Sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yep, now I can hear you. Great. Um, great presentation. I was just wondering, do you also put any detection along those lines? Definitely. Um, detection anywhere where you think there might be a uh, risk for a leak. Um, so any um, interfaces, um, let me look real okay. quick. So the, the example we had here was in a CDU where we're basically having it routed uh, around uh, the tubing, et cetera. If it was in a system, um, right. we would, you know, route around cold plates, uh, uh, route around where, um, you know, quick disconnects are entering into the system. So basically leak detection is anywhere where you think there, there might be a leak. You want to have some sort of a rope detector close to it. Or if you have a reservoir underneath uh, the system, you'd want a point detector in there. And then do you have um, these areas in some kind of drain pan that leads to a drain in the room or what is the typical practice for that? It's a good question. Are the leaks normally so small that? Usually it's um, a containment pan. So just for, uh, you know, filling the pan. Um, Okay. Hopefully, we don't have to, you know, design for such a large thing that you need a constant drain to get the fluid away. Right. Um, definitely not from like a, like I said, this is the secondary loops is inside the IT equipment, or we're not necessarily looking at that, but maybe at a facility level, um, that might be where you'd need to consider having a drain uh, for the the whole data data center as a whole. Yeah. Larger volume. Right, okay. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question, Aya. So Jessica has also posted a great point um, in the comments mm -hmm. section. You know, if anyone listening has good examples of leak events that have happened, uh, please do reach out to Michael. Yes. Um, they're looking for good examples for a white paper. So um, mm -hmm. a great way to contribute, um, you know, and, and, and get involved. And you can find Michael's email in that uh, comment thread below there. Yeah, great comment. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit as we were going through, but we're definitely looking for more examples. Anything people are willing to share, we don't have to mention names. We can be very generic. Um, if you want to contact me, with time, contact information is in the bottom of the document, or it's um, if you go to the OCP website, uh, it's I'm the uh, Coplate subproject lead. All right. Well, I think we've um, successfully. Uh hop back up to schedule. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the folks who hopped on to ask questions. That was a very productive um, 15. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next.